Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.4. In this episode, I think the goal will be to finally retrieve some science from orbit using a heat shield. Uh, I believe we've unlocked that technology, but we have unlocked quite a few different technologies, so I think our first course of action should be to go into VAB and take a good look at what we've got available to us and see what we can do from there. Now it's important to remember that we do have some rockets already built that we can use. We have the Stalwart P which is able to launch something into lunar orbit and we have two Colossuses. Colossi, Colossi I guess. Um, and so those are capable of uh, doing substantial things as well. A uh, lunar satellite or a Mars probe. So we don't really need to build a brand new rocket in order to do any particular mission as long as it's within uh, Earth SOI or to Mars for instance so we could just edit the probe so that's something important to keep in mind but let's take a look at the parts that we have available in the VAB as far as engines are concerned that's not an engine we can use uh, that's not an engine we can use this seems to be a little bit early for this, considering it's planned for the Angara rocket, so it's not in the right place. Yeah, I don't think this is in the right place since this is using the Soyuz 2.1B or Angara, that's much later, so that's not something we can use. It's not placed in the right location. But we have heat shields, and the one I really want is this one. So I'm just going to uh, pick up that. He Let's pick up all the heat shields. We'll need them eventually. Okay, so wow, that, that one was much more expensive than this one. Interestingly, we don't have a heat shield that can fit the pod. Now, we've got basic capsules unlocking in 13 days, but none of these heat shields will fit that capsule. So, we've got to watch out for that. It's possible that the capsule has ablator on it anyway, but we'll have to keep that in mind for when we do crewed missions. Don't get too excited if it doesn't have ablative shielding. I'm a little bit disappointed. We don't seem to have too much that is really new. Okay. Well, let's take a look at our contracts. Now, we don't have any contracts active except for the crude altitude record ones and the speed record. So going in order, we could toss something into polar orbit, but that's, I mean, that's worth very minor amounts. Uh, specific orbit of Earth is worth very little. Science data from space around Earth, we could probably do automatic, I mean, we can do as part of another mission, but it's not a major mission. Um, the explain stuff, suborbital flight crude we've done before, geostationary orbit is something we haven't done. Yeah, that that could be very interesting. I mean, uh, it could just be interesting, not very interesting, but it could be interesting, and uh, that's quite a bonus for completion. Crude lunar flyby, well, we definitely need to test actually getting into orbit with crew first. Lunar impact we've done before, but that's very lucrative. I mean, you take a look at that, that's pretty lucrative and compared to the other missions. Uh, that's just way out there. Um, science data from space around Mars, not really paying us much. I wonder if we could do, uh, let's take a peek and see if we could do that right now. But uh, yeah, let me pick, to, uh, pick up something substantial instead of just that sort of thing. Well, they're giving us seven years, I could probably do it by then. But let's see, successful re-entry. This one is unmanned. Okay, I think this is what we want. Recover a craft from orbital velocity descent. Doesn't have to be doesn't have to be crude. Yeah, I think that's what I want to do for our testing. And that has to be done within a year. I think we can do that. Venus flyby within two years. Uh, it's actually one uh, one whole year until we get to the right phase angle for that. So we we better wait before picking up that contract just in case. Uh, we can do a Jupiter flyby, but uh, that is uh, it'll take like five years to get there or something like that. So we better hold off on that until we're sure we can do it. Same for Saturn. Uh, they're ba barely giving us enough time to get there. Uncrewed Mars landing. Wow. Hmm, we should definitely try that, but th that's not a lot of time either. Uh, interestingly, uncrewed moon, moon landing, which we should do before the Mars landing, obviously, um, they give as much advance and completion as the lunar impactor, even though the lunar impactor is much easier. 
Hmm. Okay, and then uh, the last uh, contract is position a satellite in a specific orbit of Deimos. I've tried this in the point nine zero uh, series, and that didn't work very well. But it took a lot to get into the right orbit around Deimos. Uh, I'll wait on that one as well. Okay, so maybe this one. But let me take a look if we've still got some science. To, well, let, let me just pick up the contract. Seven years is a long time. We should do some science around Mars by that point. Okay, let's pop on over to the Mars probe and see if we can do some more science. Okay, so here is our still spin stabilized Mars probe. And we've still got electric charge. We have communication. And uh, where's Mars? Should be a rather... Oh, there it is. Okay. So we're pretty high up. Let's see. Record impact data. It'll take a while. Let's uh, queue up record perturbation data and um, we'll say analyze telemetry and see what we can do if there's anything we haven't done before. Okay, so uh, time warping. Okay, let's see. Well, that didn't get us anything new. High over. Let's wait until we're low over, maybe. Maybe we'll get something new like that. Oh wait, uh, the telemetry uh, analysis we haven't done before. Let's transmit that. We'll get 18 for that. Okay, so we didn't do that before. I forgot about the probe's own telemet telemetry analysis experiment. So uh, I was focused on these sorts of uh, instruments, the ones on the, uh, you know, the normal instruments. Forgot about that experiment. So I think we fulfilled the contract. Let me just check the temperature scan. I'm sure we've done it before. But I'm just amused about the wobble. Okay. All right. So, uh, fulfilled the contract? Yes, we did. Okay. Let me uh, get rid of that. We didn't just do a Mars flyby. We we actually got to orbit. And they're probably not going to give us that contract anymore. Okay. So, yep. All right. That's fulfilled. Let's take a look at the R&D building and see what we can do with our science. Okay, so here we are. The only the only science we're currently working on is basic capsules, and that'll be done in 13 days. So this is the only one we're currently researching. So it says uh, no, already being researched. So this is the current state of our tech tree. And I was disappointed in not getting any new engines. That's because that one I, I don't feel right about using right now. I guess we did unlock this one. World's first closed cycle Carolox vacuum engine. That'll be, that, that might be pretty good. Um, if we can't unlock a uh, Hydrolox engine in the meanwhile. I, I do like the H1. The H1 would be a very nice engine to have. Well, we have enough science for that. Here we have SRBs. And you know how I feel about those. Here we have the bigger heat shields, which we'll probably need soon. And uh, upgrade for the diameter of the procedural procedural fairings to 5.6 meters. And I don't think that's pressing, but uh, eventually that'll become an issue. But the heat shields are probably more immediately important. Lunar rated heat shields and all. So anyway, let's research this one. And we've got a new upgrade point. This uh, this is ScanSat. I don't know if that gives us any more science. I don't think so. The Ranger Block 3 core is an old favorite of mine. I like that core. That's practically the only useful thing here. Maybe the Mercury Parachute Mini, but mainly that's the main thing here. And I can't unlock anything else otherwise. So it's really Mature Orbital Rocketry and then this. Can I get both? Not quite. I can get one or the other, but not both just yet. I think, uh, I think I'll go for Asterisk Vacuum Engine. That's interesting. Pressure fed. Oh, that can uh, relight. That's that'll, that'll be handy. It's got gimbal. 
it's pressure fed so it so there's no limit to the to the ignitions and no need for ullage that's pretty good okay uh, I'll go for this one and then once we get a few more points we'll unlock this one to get that Ranger block 3 core okay so that is the state of our technology and this is how the tech queue looks right now. It'll take 84 days to do general construction and then a further 169 days for mature orbital rocketry. Now upgrades, I think our the speed of our research is fine. I think we need to upgrade our building capacity for larger rockets. So I'm going to increase that rate and that rate. Okay, and I think I can afford some more. Let me get two more and get that to around one build point per second. We'll do that for now. So I'll uh, take the this Lunar Orbiter Stalwart P and I'm going to edit that one. Ah, I just noticed something. We finally have fuel lines. So as I'm building this probe, I want to purchase this because you see I've got these radial tanks here. And I'm not getting the Delta V I want. So I believe if I put this... Oh, these are huge, though. No, I'm still not getting the right delta V. Hold on. Nope. Okay, well, I've got something else. Well, anyway, let me try and figure this out. But yeah, fuel lines, so we can uh, start doing more interesting things in terms of fuel flow if we really want to. Uh, that will become important. Oh, wait. But it says, part not supported by RP0. Hmm. Uh, maybe I'll need to lay off on that then. It'll depend whether I can have fuel flow going the right way with these sorts of tanks. If I can't, and right now, I, I don't see... Well, th those work. Alright. Well, we'll see. We will see. Okay, so what I've come up with here is probably overdoing it. The stalwart P is heavier than we really need for this particular test, but I've taken advantage of that to do something interesting, so I'll, I'll mention that as we go down. But here we've got the real shoot parachute and the heat shield and two goo containers. And we've got hydrazine in this tank, but it's not a full tank. I've only set utilization to 51% because we don't need all of it. And we've got little hydrazine thrusters. And that's mainly to maintain attitude control on the way down. Now, there's, this is uh, descent and initial orientation stage if you will to make orbital corrections. It's got 605 meters per second of delta V. We really don't need that much. Um, initially this probe core was supposed to control this stage as well because we've got the guidance unit here and so obviously that guidance unit can't uh, control anything above the bottom bit. And let me just verify that guidance unit 3 meter and so what we have here is a 300 ton guidance unit so it can control the whole rocket easily but we needed something else for this so I initially put that here but you'll notice uh, after discovering that I had way too much Delta V I've put a Delta avionics package here and the reason for that is because uh, since this has so much Delta V I decided to turn it into a satellite and so I've added solar panels its own controller and also I've added little vernier thrusters. You see these little guys here? Uh, no, not that. Go away guidance unit 3 meter. Go, go, go. Okay, uh, these guys. Hello? Okay, uh, LR101 verniers and I've added those because they use kerosene and oxygen but not the same mix as the RD0105 of course. The point is that the RD0105 only has one ignition and so once it's uh, got this rocket to orbit it's done for but then we can light these ver verniers in sets of two and we, so we can uh, have it boost its orbit initially using two of the LR-101s and then circularize the orbit with the other set of LR-101s the efficiency is horrible these guys have uh, 238 vacuum ISP and of course they don't have the right fuel mixture and they have a ridiculous gimbal range because they're vernier thrusters but but they give us the extra ignitions without too much extra mass and so that is a plus so that we can use up all the fuel 
get into a nice orbit. There is hydrazine in this tank, so we can do that. In fact, I could add even more fuel than I've got right now. You can see um, that there's healthy margins all the way around. So, but I don't think we really, I'm, I'm not going for geosynchronous orbit with this sort of thing. So yeah, we'll just keep it to this. We're just doing a re-entry test and we'll work from there. So let me package this up. Uh, we've got four of the big solar panels. I'll action group those. I've action grouped the commutron on top. And of course those snap in the atmosphere. So we can't really rely on communications once we're in the middle of re-entry. So I've got number two arm the parachute. Very important. And I'll have number three uh, the solar panels. I'm not going to action group the goo containers. I'll do that manually. Okay, so this is the situation. After this, avionics is still good. Yes, avionics is still good. Unfortunately, it's going to take, because of all the changes I've done, it's got to take 30 days to build this. Not originally my intention. However, the additional cost shouldn't be too much. Yep. We should be all right. All right, well, uh, let me get this started. Okay, we are completing basic capsules while the re-entry test is still constructing. And I think I'll prepare an uncrewed test of the re-entry capsule. So uh, I'll follow that, uh, follow that re-entry test with that. And so that'll be in our second build slot. So let me go back to VAB. Um, I don't know if I should edit the Colossus. I think I'll start with... Uh, Maybe we'll work with another stalwart. Yeah, let me go to VAB. We won't use the Colossus, I don't think. I don't know. The Colossus could... It'll probably take so much time anyway to edit the Colossus to something that I'd like. Maybe I should just start from scratch. Let me see what I can do. I, I don't think I'll use one of these. Let me start from scratch in the VAB. Okay, so let me introduce the Asterid. And as you can see, we've got a launch escape system. Now this is going to be an uncrewed test. So we've got a, a controller here. This is the Able Avionics package capable of carrying five tons. And we've got an RCS tank here and the parachutes. It's actually because of the Able Avionics package that we've got the parachutes and RCS tank here instead of uh, having um, instead of having the parachutes in line like one of uh, these guys and having the RCS tank at the bottom uh, or in the capsule of course we have HTP instead of hydrazine so that's a little bit complicated but uh, yeah that's why I put the parachutes like that radially instead of oops we've got a little bit of lag here I'll probably have to restart the game before launching something anyway uh, so I've done the conventional launch escape thing and because of the form factor, because it is wide and this is wide, but the able avionics package is narrow, I put the parachutes there. We do have a service module here, and we've got one kilonewton thrusters, as you can see, RCS and antennae. Uh, here we have uh, uh, the Agena avionics package, and that will allow me to potentially deorbit this stage which will obviously get into orbit but uh, this engine has restarts oh so we've got the RCS to use if we want to use that to deorbit it and so this tank has hydrazine as well as the kerosene and oxygen now this engine is the RD58 or its predecessor whatever you want to call this one S1.5400 anyway but yeah it's it's the it's the R7 upper stage, and so, well, you can read all this. It's very long. In any case, the point is that it was used as an upper stage on the R7 family of rockets. And it's got better thrust than the RD0105 that we've been using. And it's also got better vacuum ISP. And it's got five ignitions. So it's got all the things. And so it's a natural choice. Also, it doesn't cost much more. I don't know how they figure out the costs of this stuff, but this is a much better engine than this one is. But it's only 350, it is 400. So, yep. Yeah. Go figure. So, we have that there. Then we have the large controller for the overall control of the rocket. That carries 300 tons, and the rocket's only, well, it's less than 200 tons. 
Uh, so the next stage is, if I can get the fairing here, this one is an LR105 sustainer. We've seen this one before at work. And so it's going to be doing the middle of the of the boost, the second stage. Uh, so it starts out at a thrust weight ratio about 1, ends up at 2.59. It's not too bad. Finally at the bottom we have four of these LR89s and we've definitely seen these before. Now of course some of you will note that to get to orbit of course we could have done an atlas configuration in which case we'd be using two of these plus the LR105 in the middle uh, and then we'd have a lighter rocket. This is true. We'd also have incredibly high g-forces and uh, and quite a quick uh, launch to orbit, but we were also carrying a little bit more to orbit than I believe Mercury was. Uh, we have a slightly heavier load, so that's that's the case. Uh, Mercury didn't have quite the well, it didn't have the remote controller. It didn't have the uh, larger service module that we're using here. And by the way, uh, this RCS tank here is locked, so we're not reading that. Uh, in this, uh, well, we wouldn't read the Delta V anyway because it only fuels the RCS up there. But yeah, so we're, we're using four. And you go, well, we have a pretty high thrust rate ratio there. Well, that's all right because I action grouped two of them and so we'll shut two of the engines down when we get to high TWR so that we'll have a smooth ride for the Kerbal. Yep, so that is the plan. I've got the launch escape system action group to zero. Um, I don't plan to use it for aborts, but uh, I guess we could configure it for that. Yeah, I guess I will. All right. Um, other. Abort. In the case of an abort, we would want to probably... Well, we'll, we'll decouple from here. Would be reasonable. Okay. So that settles that, and that's our rocket. Now you might wonder, well, why didn't you use radio boosters? That's obviously much better, etc., etc., etc. Well, uh, just for the look of it, actually. And uh, this means that this is an expandable system if we choose to do that. I mentioned while using the, which we've got, uh, these engines, the LR87 pair, that we could have used four of these engines, so I wanted to try that out that theory. Overall I think this is lighter than Soyuz, uh, the Vostok version, and uh, heavier than Atlas. But And it's got sort of a very similar um, duration. Uh, it's a long trip to orbit basically and that, that was the way um, the R7 system brought Vostok to orbit. So we'll see how it works and we'll do it without a Kerbal in at first. Okay so well, they'll ask us for to put a Kerbal in later, but I'll just start out by removing Jeb, and I'm going to build this one. Okay, well, let's get on to the re-entry test, warping to complete, and if the re-entry test works all right, then we will do the test of the capsule return. So, similar thing, but a sort of heavier vehicle, and leading to bigger and better things, of course. Okie dokie, so here we are. Actually, this launch is heavier than the other one. It's just that the capsule that's coming back, the, the part that we are trying to recover, is lighter. And that's because we have all this extra delta V in this stage. But anyway, uh, here we go. Brawl is up, SAS is on, and, well, ignition. And off we go. This is the stalwart with a modified upper stage. Stalwart P in particular. Okay, we are past the speed of sound and approaching six kilometers in altitude. Everything is looking fine. Okay, well, it's giving me the time on the core stage instead of the whole, uh, instead of the boosters. So, I think we're less than 30 seconds off from booster separation. We are at 17 kilometers in altitude, still going quite well. 
trajectory is nominal. And, well, I hope that trajectory is nominal. I don't entirely remember what the proper trajectory for the stalwart P is. So hopefully I'm going well here. Okay, boosters are out, set. And... well, they didn't collide with each other, so... It's a good separation. And now we've got the R7 booster in... oh wait, uh, Smart ESS is not handling this very well. Uh-oh. Uh... why is this doing this? Surely we've tested this before, right? This doesn't have gimbling? Hold on. Um, we can't shut it down, obviously. Uh, it has gimbal of some sort. Um, but maybe we've gone too far already. Who chose this rocket? Dang it. This is not good. I mean, we have enough delta V, obviously, but um, we have to point it in the roughly right direction. So we seem to have a little bit of gimbling, not a whole lot. You can see it turning there. They, they, they are turning. Try and get it to the right place. Okay, somewhere around there would be nice. Can you hold that? Can you can you can you hold that? Don't flip, don't flip. Okay. Well Yeah, it's because Smart ASS sometimes decides not to control the thing. Otherwise we should have just continue pointing in the same at the same angle before. I wonder if it'll be alright now. We need to give it 40 degrees instead of 33 now that we've lost some speed and tiny wap waps is flipping around like that. Well, good thing we have a whole lot of extra juice in the next stage, huh? But we don't have a lot of time, right? It's a low thrust weight ratio stage. So we'll have to manage that carefully. Alright, well I'll see you as we get further along here. Okay, half a minute left to go, and we're really picking up steam with this stage now. And since we really don't need all of the next stage to get into orbit, even though it's a low thrust to weight ratio stage, we don't have to have so much time to apoapsis. In fact, it is way overdoing it. So let's just flatten out. Now, it's not a bad idea to have the, the re-entry test happen with uh, high apoapsis so that uh, we see, you know, the upper bounds of what kind of heat we can expect. At least from uh, low Earth orbit. Obviously, we're not doing a test from uh, lunar return, which is a totally different thing altogether. Okay, separation. Ignition and fairing separation. Okay, antennae out. Now those would snap in the atmosphere, so can't rely on them. And that's all right. We'll arm the parachute ahead of time and hope that the probe can orient properly for re-entry all on its own. We've got the goo containers fairly low on it, so the center of mass should be very low. Well, we seem not to be pointed in the right place, so let me do the smart ASS thing again. Yeah. Now let's... Oh, not smart, yeah. We have to switch off of smart ASS with every staging, it's weird. 
Now we could have replaced this engine with that uh, RD58 that has the five ignitions. That will make this better and we wouldn't need to use the verniers, but I didn't want to rebuild this rocket again. So, since it was almost done. But uh, yeah, obviously next time we wouldn't need to put the verniers, we'd just use that engine which will uh, allow us to restart it. And that will boost it to... Actually, uh, we could pr probably pick up that geo stationary orbit contract and then use that engine to take care of the business pretty effectively. Oh shoot, how did I forget the antennae? Dang it! I, I gave this solar panels so that I could become a satellite but it doesn't have antenna on it. Oh uh, well, we'll just deorbit this stage then. Ah, uh, that's, that's a big mistake. That's costly. We should... Uh, how did I not put antenna on it? Silly. Just forgot that piece of it. Okay, well anyway, we can test the idea of using these verniers, even though we're never going to use them again for this purpose. Huh. Okay, here we go, and I'll toss the probe up to uh, apoapsis of 500 kilometers, I think. That's about the uh, maximum that we'd be doing from low Earth orbit. Or maybe we'll end up higher, actually, looking at it. Let's see. Okay, so 620, let's six, six, 619 by 136. Alright, well, uh, but we'll lose connection with this. Hmm. Hold on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna lose connection with this portion. We should just deorbit this portion. Let's test those verniers. So, throttle and ignition. So, this is working out quite well. Except in the opposite direction I was initially intending it to go. And by the way, I do know that this core does have some range to it. But it's just not enough to serve as a communication satellite. Okay, so with that done, we will separate off, I think. I could conceivably transfer fuel, but we were not that short. We'll be alright. Okay, uh, set. Okay, now our little probe will do the rest of the business all on its own. We'll do one goo container on the way down, but let's observe biosample right now. We... we don't get anything for that? Have we already done this? We can't have. But, what, we don't get anything for recovery of this? I don't know, keep data. We're not gonna be doing it anywhere else. Can we at least record perturbation? No, oh, that's useless. We can't have done this before, have we? Maybe I just forgot. I mean, we but we should get extra for recovering a biological sample, right? Well, I suppose we strictly don't need to get into a full orbit. We could actually drop our periapsis. But I would like to be over around here, over KSC sort of territory when we go down. So uh, I'll boost to a full orbit and then bring it down, like, let's say, in the Atlantic. No! Ah, uh, hey, I thought we were gonna... I thought we were going to ignite the engine, not separ separate the thing. Okay, well, parachute armed. Where, where would we end up if I drop my periapsis now, instead of raising it? Uh, maybe over the west coast. Okay. Alright, change of plans. We'll, we'll just bring it back down. This is sort of depressing. I think I'll bring it in at uh, 75 kilometers, let's say. 
Looks like a good place. I'm gonna tell Smart ASS to hold retrograde with RCS available to it. Sudden spell there. Okay, so Smart ASS is doing that. I have connections, so I'm going to boost that periapsis again. These antennae should break off. Okay, and let's do another biosample. I don't know, I mean, I'm very disappointed that we are not going to get data from that. I don't recall doing it, but it has been quite a few episodes. While I still have connection, let me verify the parachute info. We've got uh, main chute deploying at 0.3 atmospheres. Secondary chute deploying at 0.4 atmospheres, so lower than that, just in case. Well, seems like it's okay. I intend to keep the heat shield on. The parachute should be able to take care of all of this. I mean, not that I can send it off anyway, because, oh wait, I now have connection. Where are we? Oh, uh, Hawaii. Connection through Hawaii, well, to Hawaii through um, ComTub1. Oh, not Hawaii, sorry, uh, Guam, maybe? Yeah, th I think that's Guam, not Hawaii. What, we don't have a communication station on Hawaii? That's horrible. We are at uh, 80 kilometers. Uh, there is some ablation going on. We're not slowing down very much just yet. It's pretty nominal, I suppose. We have lost connection. Still looking okay, 76 kilometers. Heat shield is hot, but none of the other parts are hot, so... So that's as expected. Plenty of hydrazine to control us. Smart ASS is doing a fine job holding retrograde. We are at 70 kilometers altitude, below 7,000 meters per second. Our deceleration is, well, it's something, but it's still not very quick. 60 kilometers. It looks like the acceleration is definitely picking up. We're uh, at about 2.5 G's. Something blew up. Something definitely blew up here. What was it though? Oh, I think it was the antennae. The, the ones that were supposed to fail. Uh, let's just verify. Yeah, the Cumutron 16's ripped off by a strong airflow and once they were ripped off they exploded. Okay, well, that's that's expected. We're uh, right next to Hawaii, so presumably it'll be fairly easy for people to pick this up. We should be getting close to peak G-load here. I think we gotta be at around 6.5, 6.7. So yeah, I don't get what was up with the goo containers not giving us any additional science, but... Uh, looking at the contract... Successful re-entry just says we have to return home. We have to return to ground, presumably. Uh, we reached orbit. We reached orbital velocity. So, we, don't, we didn't really need to do any science. We didn't need to recover any science, according to it. So, it's now basically all up to the parachute. We didn't need much of later. But, it's probably good to have a lot of it on just to make sure the thing orients properly. Though our hydrazine certainly did most of that job, I suppose. Probably Smart ASS is going to fight against the whole situation because it's tuned to orbital retrograde and the atmosphere is going to bring us to surface retrograde. So it's going to continue burning the hydrazine. Which is fine, that'll just make the whole thing lighter at the, at the bottom and we won't be dumping hydrazine into the water or anything. So we'll wait for... Parachute deployment. 
I have no connection, so I'm not going to take any actions, even though it's possible that Remote Tech will allow me to take actions, even though it's not supposed to. Within sight of the big island of Hawaii. We are below the speed of sound, and presumably at safe uh, velocities for parachute deployment, assuming it decides to do that. Okay, we have a parachute deployment, the main chutes, and then we'll have a second deployment at 0.4 atmospheres, I believe. Okay, full parachute deployment, bringing us to a velocity of 5 meters per second, which should be fine. And all of Smart ASS's attempts with the hydrazine will not knock us to a higher velocity than that, so that's good. Okay, splashdown. Alright, and lots of rollicking fun with Smart ASS. Doing too much. Okay, I'm just gonna take off the. Okay, I guess I can't take off the RCS. Or can I? Oh, it finished up the hydrazine. Okay. Alright, you can sort of see if you can see the mountains there. That's the big island of Hawaii there. And I'm just gonna have to wait until I can recover this thing, cause it's got no, it's got no reaction wheel. Yes, got recover vessel. Very good. <sighs> well, once we get reaction wheels, we'll have to put one of those on just so that when we splash down, it's not gonna be rolling all over the place. Okay, so we did get ten science uh, from recovery of vessel returned from Kerberin orbit, not from any experiment. Uh, so we can unlock that other technology I was aiming for. We got the parts back, but only half the value because we were in the Pacific. Okay, and we should have had the contract done. Yes, successful re-entry. Only one science for that. And many other pieces were destroyed in the process. Okay, so uh, let us unlock that technology that I was aiming for. This one with the Ranger Block 3 core, I believe. That's really the only thing in it, though. So, I'll take care of the Asterid test in the next episode, and hopefully if that works out in the next episode, we will launch a Kerbal to orbit. And I want to do those together so that I recall all the things I need to do with the Asterid to make it work, you know, like shutting off those two engines and all that. And uh, so it's best to do the test and the real mission at, in, at the same sitting. So I'll try that out. Okay, but uh, yeah, so tune in for that. Our first attempt to recover a Kerbal. Hopefully we'll get some science out of it as well. Uh, we will pick up the contract. What is it? 58 oh, days? Man. So, um... Well, this is just a successful re-entry, but it's not, it's not crude. They want a crude lunar flyby. They actually aren't interested in just getting a Kerbal to orbit anymore. But that's alright, we'll get these altitude and speed records. That's not much, but it's something. Okay, well, that's how it is. Alright, so on that note, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.